from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, on behalf of the Library of Congress, welcome to the 2011 Book Festival. We hope you're having a great day. Um, before we begin, I want to inform you that the proceedings in this pavilion are uh, being filmed for the Library of Congress's website and for their archives and by C-SPAN for airing on Book TV, so please be mindful of that as you watch the presentation. Um, please don't sit on the camera risers in the back. We wouldn't want a camera toppling on anybody. Um, and please, if you could, silence cell phones. I'm Marcus Brackley. I'm the executive editor of the Washington Post. We are proud to be a charter sponsor of the festival, as we have been in the 11 years since it's been going. Um, as you all know who are here, the festival is really one of the cities in the nation's great literary festivals, a place where books and writing, thinking, and the people who do all of those things are celebrated. It's my great privilege today to open uh, this pavilion by introducing Eugene Robinson. The act of introducing him to an audience in Washington is probably an exercise in redundancy. He's a big figure in this town, and for many good reasons. He's a longtime reporter and editor at The Post. He now writes an op-ed column for the paper and the website and is syndicated nationally. As you know, if you read him, he writes thoughtfully and compassionately, and he's written on just about any subject and every subject you or I or anybody else might find interesting. He's also held just about every job at The Post. He started as a reporter covering City Hall. He worked as city editor. He covered South America. He was London bureau chief. He was foreign editor, and he was assistant managing editor overseeing the style section before he began writing opinion columns in 2005. He's won a Pulitzer Prize for his commentary for his columns on the 2008 presidential campaign. Today he's here because he is also an author. His latest book, Disintegration, is a fascinating exploration of the ever-shifting sands and understandings of race in America. It's terrain that he has covered powerfully before. In his book, Coal to Cream, Gene, who is a South Carolina native, described himself as an African-American who once was black, once was a Negro, once was a colored boy. In that book, there's a telling sentence that sets up the ideas in his new books. He writes, I'm a chronic integrator, sometimes by accident, sometimes by design, who since high school has always been either a black student at white schools or a black employee at white institutions. Contrast that with the title of the first chapter of his new book, Black America Doesn't Live Here Anymore. You get the idea of the journey that Gene is taking. It's an extraordinary one, and one I hope you will all join in reading his, when you read his book. Gene Robinson. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, um, thank you everyone for coming, and thank you, Marcus, for that, uh, that wonderful introduction. Um, Marcus is a, a great journalist who has what I think has to be one of the toughest jobs in America, um, editing a great daily newspaper uh, in the era of the internet, in an era that is not being kind to great uh, daily newspapers. Uh, and yet maintaining the, the, the quality of the journalism uh, and the, the ambition and the accomplishment of, of the Washington Post. And Marcus does it elegantly. Um, uh, and he's been doing it for several years now, he, and he's not wizened and bent over as most of us would be or crushed by the pressure. Um, and uh, so I, I, um, let me first applaud him and thank him for his... Uh, for his exertion. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, talk a bit about um, disintegration, uh, which is um, just out in paperback, and how that book came about, and what it's about, and then uh, open it up to questions, and, and uh, we can have more of a conversation for the second half of this, uh, of, of this time we have together. Um, uh, disintegration, by the way, is just out in uh, paperback, coming out now, right now. So um, uh, anyone who was uh, interested, I think the nice folks at Barnes & Noble would be happy to sell you a copy. Um, I, disintegration is a book that grew out of a nagging feeling 
uh, it was, uh, to the extent that there was a conversation at all about black America, I felt, uh, it was an unreal conversation. Uh, it, it, it seemed to be, uh, uh, it, it seemed to have very little connection with the reality that I was seeing every day. Uh, so this, this, this kind of thought worked on me for really a couple of years, uh, in 2005, 2006, and I was thinking that, well, maybe there's some sort of book here. Maybe, uh, my, my thought was that, that black America was really much more diverse uh, economically, socially, and culturally than uh, it was, uh, than we made it out to be. That when we talked about black America, we talked about, talked about it as if it were still 1967 or 1968, uh, and you could make certain generalizations that just weren't valid anymore, I thought. Uh, uh, and so I kind of, I didn't know where this led, and then in um, 2007, actually, three things happened that, um, that made me think this is definitely a book. Uh, the first was that the Pew Research Center, uh, which does all sorts of interesting, interesting surveys about anything uh, under the sun, uh, did a survey of African Americans and buried sort of toward the end of this, uh, of these survey findings uh, was the following question and response. 37% um, of the black Americans who were interviewed by Pew uh, said they no longer believed black Americans could be thought of as a single race. And I said, wow, that is a really weird finding. There was no kind of backup to say exactly what that meant. But I said, well, you know, that seems to fit into what I've been thinking, and I think it's probably, I think it means something, but I don't know exactly what it means. The second thing that happened was uh, that at a group of black publishing executives from the African American press around the country were in Washington for a meeting, and they were invited here, uh, invited to the Washington Post for a reception. And I was asked to deliver a few remarks at this reception, kind of a drive-by greeting, five minutes, hello, how are you, welcome to Washington, um, uh, you can catch the trolley outside and I'll you know, see you later. And so I went downstairs to our auditorium and I, and I spoke with this group for a while, and uh, and I started getting into this question of diversity in the black community and whether when we talked about black America we were talking about uh, reality. And the response was incredible. This five minute drive by turned into uh, an hour, uh, it, it, which, which was more them talking to me than me talking to them and people said, you know, it's really true. And, you know, there's this, there's this group that's in the middle class that, that's doing well, but this, there's this also this group that's not doing well, and somebody pipes up, you know, what about the immigrants, um, black immigrants, and, and it, was, it, it was just a really energizing uh, and in some ways validating uh, a dialogue, and it made me think, well, there is something here. Um, so I started doing research. I started looking at census data, um, at marketing studies, academic papers, um, journalism, anything I could get my hands on that kind of addressed this question of what was black America today as opposed to black America uh, 40 years ago. And uh, then, I, then I actually worked up the proposal that, um, that that uh, uh, for disintegration and uh, signed up with uh, Doubleday to do the book. Uh, and then the third thing happened in 2007, which is that the presidential campaign of Barack Obama 
uh, caught fire. This, this uh, junior senator from Illinois who had a, a name off the Guantanamo detainees list uh, all of a sudden was not just a, a viable candidate for the Democratic nomination, but it looked like he might get it. Uh, and uh, so I talked to my editors, um, my book editors, who were um, by then kind of patiently waiting for me to get started and uh, explained that I didn't really think I could do this book until I knew how that story came out. Um, so I did wait for that story to come out. Um, and uh, I will tell just a little brief story, of, um, I'd like to interject. Um, as some of you know, I grew up in Orangeburg, South Carolina uh, in the late 1950s early 1960s, uh, toward the end of Jim Crow. I uh, went to segregated schools, um, lived in a black neighborhood on the black side of town, um, because that's where one lived. Uh, I was too young to remember, but Dr. King did visit my church uh, and spoke. Uh, there are two black colleges in Orangeburg, and in, uh, in 1968, uh, there was an incident that became known as the Orangeburg Massacre. Uh, students from South Carolina State University uh, began a demonstration over a segregated bowling alley in the heart of, of Orangeburg. It's called the All-Star Lanes, long since closed. Uh, but it was a whites-only bowling alley. And this protest over the bowling alley grew into something larger. Uh, and it mushroomed over the course of, of three nights. After the second night, um, this demonstration was about 500 yards from my house, so we had kind of a direct line of sight. Uh, after the second night, I remember um, getting up in the morning, schools were all closed, uh, and looking out the window to see what was going on, and my father, who was a, an extremely gentle man, uh, yelled at me in a voice that he had never used before and said, get down out of that window right now. And uh, so I ducked down, and then he let me peek over the windowsill. And right across the street from our house, there was a line of 12 highway patrol cars. The state troopers were out of the cars behind the open doors of their cars with the, the rifles pointed uh, at a house two doors down from our house. And they were looking for uh, the uh, organizer from the Student Nonviolent Co Coordinating Committee from SNCC, a man named Cleveland Sellers, who they correctly suspected was the uh, outside agitator who was uh, stirring up all the colored folk in Orangeburg, and they were coming to get him. Um, he had better intelligence than they had, so he was long gone, so there was no gunfire that morning. Uh, however, that night, there was. Uh, the uh, highway patrol claimed to have been fired on by the, from the campus. Um, gunfire was um, never demonstrated. It was never proved that anybody on the campus had any weapons, but nonetheless, the state troopers did fire at the, into the crowd, and, and when the smoke cleared, three, black, three young black men had been killed, all shot in the back or the soles of their feet. A um, uh, couple of dozen other people injured. That's, that was the Orangeburg Massacre. If you kind of fast forward to election night on, on 2008, uh, when we were about to see how the Obama story was coming out, I was uh, at Rockefeller Center uh, with my very interesting but somewhat dysfunctional uh, MSNBC family um, <laughs> on the anchor desk. Um, and it was that period when it was really dysfunctional, you know, because uh, we had Keith Olbermann and Chris Matthews and, and uh, uh, Rachel Maddow and I were there and kind of trying to figure out <laughs> what, what the deal was with, with Keith and Chris. And, uh, uh, and um, at uh, 10.45 that evening, we heard for our little earpieces that the network was going to call the election for Obama at 11 o'clock. And so I 
got to live one of the moments of my life that I will never forget. I got to, at the next break, take out my cell phone and call uh, my father and mother. My father was then 92 years old. Um, and he died several months later, actually, right before the inauguration. Uh, but I got to call my father and my mother, who was 87, and, um, uh, and tell them that they had lived to see the election of the first African-American president in U.S. history. Uh, it's a moment I will never forget, uh, a moment none of us, I think, will ever forget. Uh, and, and certainly a moment that, um, uh, that, that kind of rounded out the arc of the, of the story that, um, that I had decided I wanted to tell with disintegration, which was uh, essentially that there isn't one black America anymore. Um, I, I somewhat arbitrarily, because I think such decisions are almost always arbitrary, uh, came out with not one black America, but four. Uh, and, uh, and they are as follows. From all the research I did, uh, all the interviewing I did, it seemed to me that, number one, there was a, a majority of African Americans, um, not a huge majority, but a majority, uh, that had managed to enter the middle class, such as there is a middle class in this country anymore, we can discuss that, and we could also discuss the impact the recession has had. Um, but that, if, if you look not only at, at, at income, but if you look at education uh, and other sorts of social indicators, and you try to, to make a realistic assessment of not only where people are, but what their prospects are, um, I, I, I see a majority that entered the middle class, and I call that group the mainstream. Um, it, it was clear to me, too, that there is, um, however, that there is also a very large uh, minority of African Americans. Uh, 35%, perhaps, 30, 35%, maybe that much. Um, that did not make that climb from poverty to the middle class and for whom that climb is um, more difficult and actually becoming more improbable uh, than it has been in decades simply because so many rungs of that ladder are missing. Uh, those blue collar jobs uh, that used to exist that a person with um, uh, who perhaps didn't have a college education, but um, but was but wanted to work and 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 do better for his or her family. Um, uh, could you, you could get a get a job, have um, job security, um, uh, good salary, good benefits, uh, a pension when they retired, um, could have a little house, could send their kids to college. Uh, so the kids would have a better life. Um, millions of African Americans, uh, many of whom participated in the Great Migration from South to North, uh, took advantage of this great sort of escalator uh, that the auto industry in Detroit provided and that, uh, um, uh, that other industries in, in Chicago or Baltimore or wherever uh, provided. One example is uh, Michelle Obama's family. Uh, the way, uh, uh, and, and her father is sort of the, um, uh, the person I think of when I, when I think of, of, uh, of this striving, achieving uh, uh, group of, of African Americans. Uh, and where are those jobs? Well, they're in, you know, they're in, they're in China. A lot of them are in China. They're going to be moving offshore from China, I guess, at some point soon to, 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 um, uh, to places where you can pay even lower wages. But, uh, but they're not here, and they're not going to be here. Uh, so it's this huge group of African Americans that, to my mind, has become abandoned, uh, practically. And so that's what I call that group, the abandoned. Uh, and then I saw something that struck me as new, 
um, a group of African Americans who have achieved or attained wealth, power, or influence um, on a scale far beyond anything we had, <coughs> we had seen before. Um, not just relative to other African Americans, but relative to anybody in the world. And so, you know, the number one obvious example would be President Obama, President of the United States, but also Oprah Winfrey or um, uh, Bob Johnson, the founder of uh, black entertainment television, with, I think was the first black billionaire. Um, uh, Richard Parsons, who uh, was uh, chairman and CEO of the, of the world's biggest uh, entertainment, uh, media and en entertainment company, Time Warner, uh, and then was asked to come back after his retirement, um, leave his vineyard in Tuscany and come back to uh, help um, right the ship at Citi Citigroup after the, after the collapse. Uh, it, it, and so we had a, we had a tableau that could n we could never have had ever in history, an, an, an African-American president uh, grappling with the worst financial economic crisis since the Great Depression, uh, sees that a steady hand is needed at this giant um, uh, world important financial institution city group and is able to call on an African-American seasoned CEO to come in and help right the ship. That's, that, that couldn't have happened before. So I called this tiny group uh, the transcendent group uh, and, uh, and actually opened the book with a scene from a party at, uh, at uh, Vernon Jordan's house that was, uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, and finally, I saw something new um, that I called emergent black America. And this emergent group I further subdivided into kind of two categories. One is the record number of black immigrants from, uh, from the Caribbean, but especially from Africa, who have come to this country in the last two or three decades, especially the last 20 years, uh, who are, uh, who arrive from Ethiopia or Nigeria or Ghana uh, with intact families, without a lot of money, but with a tremendous amount of education. It's the best educated group of immigrants coming to this country today. Um, and, and whose children are doing spectacularly well. Uh, a few years ago, Skip Gates and um, Lonnie Guineer at, at Harvard uh, did an, an informal survey that has been since replicated with more rigor. Um, well, what they did was they just took a list of the incoming black freshmen at Harvard and, uh, and checked how many were African surnames. And it was a little more than half, I believe. Uh, I, my wife, for several years, ran uh, a uh, college access and scholarship program that she founded for um, African-American students from the Washington area, uh, we found the same thing. We found that at least, I would say, 35 to 40 percent of, uh, and at times more, of the high-achieving black students in this area had African surnames. Clearly, obviously, either Ethiopian or Nigerian or Ghanaian. Um, and this sort of um, uh, nascent record of achievement tells me that this is going to be a very, very important group uh, in the future. Uh, the other uh, emergent group that I saw uh, is the increasing number of biracial uh, um, uh, black, white Americans who self-identify uh, as African American, but whose relationship with white America is somewhat different um, in, nuanced, in a nuanced way, but somewhat different from mine, as President Obama has talked about this. Remember during his race speech in Philadelphia when uh, he essentially said, uh, uh, before he threw Reverend Wright under the bus, he said, uh, I, can't, I could no more throw Reverend Wright under the bus than I could my, my own 
grandmother, whom I've, my white grandmother, whom I've heard say racially insensitive things. And it, it seems to me that this is a, this is a nuanced, and, uh, perhaps difference, but it's a distinction. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. Um, so those are the four groups I saw, um, mainstream, abandoned, transcendent, emergent. Uh, and disintegration really is, a, is about kind of how we got to where we are uh, and potentially where we're headed. Uh, and where I really come out is that um, whatever is left of affirmative action, whatever, whatever attention we have, we can summon for, um, uh, for uh, promotion of equality and justice in this country. Um, we need to focus it on this abandoned group. Um, uh, and if it means the rest of us gotta fend for ourselves, that's fine. But, but we're really in danger of losing millions and millions of, of, of people who are just kind of dropping off the map in terms of, uh, of, um, of this society. So um, thank you again for coming. I'm gonna stop talking now and, and so we can do a few minutes of, uh, of questions. So thank you, thank you. There are a couple of microphones up here. Question regarding your uh, primary thesis on. Could you, sir, could you pull the mic down? Oh, yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. On your uh, primary thesis, that um, uh, you have these three uh, groups, so to speak. Uh, don't you think the same um, uh, situation applies to uh, many ethnic and racial groups that you, you have a. Uh, you might call a emergent group, a transcendent group, and those that might be left out. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be, that might apply to other mm -hmm. ethnic and racial groups. Yeah, the question is whether that <clears throat> this sort of schema applies to other ethnic and racial groups. Um, you know, in a, in a in a I'd say in a in a um, in a general sense, I think you could certainly. Um, uh, you, you could you could certainly look at other groups in a similar fashion. I'm not sure you'd come out with the with the same way of of kind of figuring out distinctions. For example, if you were talking about Latinos, um, you might um, you might put some emphasis on national origin, for example, which is which is still a, um, um, you know kind of an important factor in some people's lives, uh, but. Yeah, you could use the, sa uh, the same method, I think, for kind of looking at, at, at other groups, too. Yeah. You, you uh, made your distinction along race lines, but it see, as you were speaking, it seems as though addressing the problems of the abandoned would be as much a class and economic solution mm -hmm. as, as racial. Yeah, are we talking about... Could you please address that? Are we, uh, right, are we talking race or are we talking class? Um, I think the inevitable answer is both. And what I, you know, I, I tried to go into the book with an open mind um, and, and try to prepare myself to be led to the conclusion that really we didn't need to talk about race anymore, we just needed to talk about class. I didn't come to that conclusion, actually. I mean, I, I, and I found it, uh, yeah, but I, no, but I understand. I, um, I found it Im impossible to kind of tease, um, to tease the two apart. Uh, and uh, so I, but yes, the, certainly the economic, um, uh, the, the, the economic situation of the abandoned um, will be addressed when we, hey, here's an idea, when we talk about poverty, when we talk about ways to alleviate poverty, when we actually uh, pay more than lip service um, uh, to the notion that everybody, you know, deserves a chance in the society. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, 
I very, I very much admire your work. Thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to reading your book. I've not mm -hmm. had the opportunity as yet. But it strikes me in your comment about jobs uh, going away, mm -hmm. that they're in China and elsewhere in the world, um, and that they're not coming back. And, and I, I, I think that's true. I think yeah. that companies are very invested outside mm -hmm. of the United States. But I think also that they could make more of an investment here in the United States if they were motivated to do so. Mm -hmm. um, for example, just um, retraining of the abandoned, regardless of, of right. whether it's class or you know, ethnicity, but the retraining aspect, um, mm -hmm. building more um, um, tr uh, schools, secondary, not secondary schools, but the um, us, um, thinking of uh, two year two-year type schools right. where they're focused on that. So mm -hmm. I just wonder, do you address solutions in your book and do you think that that might be an, uh, uh, a way to incent companies, manufacturing companies and otherwise to, to, you know, to focus more on that? I, I, I do um, try to address some solutions uh, in the book um, and I kind of decided not to um, uh, not to confine myself to what I thought could get 60 votes in the Senate, you know, because otherwise I could just call, you know, Susan Collins and Olympia Snow and ask them, gee, what should we do? You know, because they would be the, the votes. But, um, uh, and where I came out is that, you know, the one thing I've seen that really works is, uh, is a uh, is very expensive because it's a holistic approach. You've got to, you've got, you've got to work on education. Um, education is complicated. Um, uh, I use example in the book of a, of a program that my former colleague, William Raspberry, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist at the, at the Post, uh, who retired and started a, a nonprofit called Baby Steps in his hometown in, in Mississippi. Um, tiny little town, mostly black, very poor. Uh, he wanted to do something, and so he decided. Um, he did it. He did some reporting. He decided early childhood education was where he could have the biggest impact. So he, he sets out to set up a program for early childhood education, and he quickly discovers that you can't just do that. You have to. Um, he he learned that you you couldn't just instruct parents on how to read to their children if there was nobody in the household who was capable of doing that in a way that really helped the children. So he needed a center for those kids to come to. He needed to do, you know, some very thorough assessment work before families came into the program. Then he needed a center for kids to come to. Then he found that he needed uh, to deal with nutritional and health issues um, uh, because there were a lot of, you know, chronic diabetes, um, obesity, um, uh, 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 and, and, and questions about, um, you know, kids who were eating a lot of empty calories but not good calories. So he had to deal with the health aspect and it just kind of mushroomed. Uh, the program's still going strong and it's having a real impact. Um, uh, but, you know, he's a famous newspaper columnist who, who's, whose name is recognized, who who was who? Who got his phone calls returned when he called, you know, the Kellogg Foundation and other big foundations, uh, and he and he managed to raise a lot of money um, that is having a real impact. It's very expensive, though, and um, and we need 30 million <laughs> Bill Raspberries. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, coming from the point of view of a uh, working in the schools in Arlington, mm -hmm. and there I saw uh, that the African American historically African-American kids versus the African, historically mm -hmm. African kids saw themselves as two complete and not necessarily friendly groups. Mm -hmm. And I was gathering from what you were saying that things got better by college age, but how do you see this? And uh, You know, I, I do think it? that, at least in my fairly limited experience, um, uh, you know, I haven't, we haven't had a chance to do sort of a longitudinal study of that relationship, but it does, it strikes me that it does, uh, that, that the friction, which you see um, uh, in, in the schools, in the, in the uh, elementary and secondary schools, um, and the sort of culture clash seems to, um, uh, seems to, to attenuate, seems to diminish 
over time, uh, and, and you see a lot less of that um, in, in college, and then, of course, as this large sort of group of, of um, either foreign-born or, or first-generation um, uh, kids uh, moves out into the workplace, I think you'll see it even less. Uh, as, they, as they kind of increasingly identify as African-American rather than as Ethiopian or or Nigerian or, or Ghanaian, and as African Americans um, expand their definition of African American. So, mm -hmm. thank you. I'd like to know if, from your research on the fragmentation of blacks if you get a sense that the election of Barack Obama will go the way of the election of Harold Washington, a moment in time not to be repeated anytime soon, or has the country gotten to a real turning point? Can you derive that from what you've looked at? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, if I knew, I would, uh, um, I'd be, um, I'd be in tremendous demand as a pundit. Uh, uh, I, uh, I think, from what we've seen since, I think you could make a good argument that the stars aligned um, uh, in a, in a, in a, in an unusual way um, uh, for. Uh, the election of President Obama. Uh, nonetheless, you know, they could align again. I mean, there, it, 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 you can't, it, it wasn't an accident, and it does reflect, I think, um, obviously real change in the country because it couldn't possibly have happened, um, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, I don't know if it happens again next year. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it, it and, and does it happen anytime soon? I really think um, he was the man for that specific moment if, if the man or woman for another specific moment emerges, but you know, you, don't, you just don't know, you just don't know. Good morning. Good morning. Um, enjoy watching you on CNN oh, and on The Last Word. Thank you. Okay, my question, I'm going to piggyback off of a previous comment, but from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, the comment, and I'm paraphrasing, was about the abandoned class and, mm -hmm. you know, classism and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted your take on, okay, the abandoned class, that issue has to be addressed. But oftentimes when you address the abandoned class, it's perceived as welfare or mm -hmm. classism or socialism. But then on the other end, you do have, and I'm not trying to make it this political, I'm asking a valid question, corporate welfare, bailouts yeah. and whatnot, but it's not perceived in the same way, and they're both almost the same. So why do you think that, okay, if you help the underclass, you know, there's the perception, oh, it's socialism, but it's not viewed in the same way if you bail out a larger company, the, you know, corporate mm -hmm. welfare, you know, it's almost the same. Right, well... That's an excellent question. Uh, I've asked it myself <laughs> in print, but I don't have an answer as to why um, uh, we don't see corporate welfare as uh, it, we don't recognize corporate welfare, and we do recognize, um, uh, well, gee, we don't even have welfare anymore, but we, 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 we we're certainly um, determined to get rid of, uh, of, uh, of kind of social welfare. So, um, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it, the, the similarity seems clear to me, but I can't, can't hear you. But what part of the opposition to uh, President Obama do you feel is racial? And at first it's glance it might seem obvious, but Clinton had such an ugly opposition as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's just part of the system now, or do you think, I know it's, like um, said, it's hard to determine. Uh, so the question: What part of the um, of the opposition to President Obama do I think is racial? Um, I don't know. Forty-eight point three percent, fifty-two point nine. You know, I think it's I think it's a lot. I think it's um, uh, and, uh, and some of it I think is consciously um, racial, and some of it probably is not explicit or conscious but but um, but there's a but but for some people I think his race um, uh, militates against legitimacy in some way 
that, um, and, and, and it, it is striking to me um, the extent to which people um, feel they have permission to, uh, to consider the duly elected in a landslide president of the United States as somehow Ill, 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 illegitimate, um, an illegitimate holder of the office. Um, not, just the, not just the birtherism, but, but um, <coughs> uh, and you know, if you think I'm overstating that, I'd show, I'd show you my email <laughs> because I get it. Uh, and it's sometimes very ugly. Thank you. I'm a special educator in Montgomery County Schools, mm -hmm. and even though I think it's not a special education perspective, the um, problem in I feel in education today is that the um, vocational programs in high schools have been shut down, yeah. and it's. You can be in a very intelligent person, but not interested in the academic program. Mm -hmm. And the, there seems to be no addressing this in the race to the top no. program and right. everything. I, you know, I, I agree that, um, that we, we have not been, um, we have not been creative enough in thinking of, of, of education and in offering, um, viable alternatives uh, to people, um, particularly in, the, you know, in, in, in the vocations, in, in, um, uh, and we're going to have to find some way to do that, and maybe it's through community colleges, maybe it's, you know, but why not start at the secondary level, uh, and, and, you know, it's an excellent question. We, we persist with a kind of one-size-fits-all um, when we know that one size doesn't fit all, and we know that, you know, we're not giving people the kind of education that they need to, to compete at a high level, you know, without necessarily um, having the classic liberal arts college education. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Hello, Mr. Robinson. I really Hi. enjoy watching you on MSNBC. Thank you. If, if you uh, had the opportunity to speak with President Obama, what would you tell him about the abandoned class to make them take notice? He and his uh, senior advisors to try to help that class you, you so well identified in the book. Thank you. Well, I'd say read the book, and I'd say <laughs> get in your plug. Um, <clears throat> and I would, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd throw out some numbers and statistics, and he would already know them, and he would, and he would say, that, um, and he would respond that what, he's, what he has tried to do and what he would like to do is uh, pursue policies that, um, that would uplift, you know, all people who are similarly situated, but, but policies that would necessarily have a, uh, a, a greater impact among African Americans simply because the po problems of, you know, of in, in terms of poverty and, and uh, dysfunction are so much greater. Um, I'm told that I'm out of time, so take one more question and that's it. Uh, just a quick comment on the Republican field for presidential nomination. Um, <laughs> a quick comment on the Republican field. Um, uh, well, <coughs> it says a lot that after, you know, we, we had several weeks of, you know, when will Rick Perry get in? If Rick Perry would only get in, that's the guy. Uh, and now it's, you know, where's Chris Christie? Please, Chris Christie, can get in the race. Um, they still, to my mind, haven't found, uh, and I think it's, this is clear to the Republican establishment, they haven't found a candidate yet who they're confident can beat President Obama next year, and um, I, you know, I thought the toughest candidate for him to face last time around would have been Romney. I think that's true again this time, but I don't know if Republicans' um, primary electorate will choose Mitt Romney um, because of Romney care. So, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.